The network's largest tool is our group site website, which is an online platform that enables members to send group emails, post discussion topics, or relevant news to discussion boards, and use a shared group calendar. So if you're interested in joining the network and using these tools, please visit the, the web address on the screen now. It's sccn.groupsite.com and click join this group now. For those of you on the webinar who are already members, I want to encourage you to use these tools to help get your message out. Uh, you have a receptive audience at your fingertips, so please don't be shy and, and please use these tools we have for you. Another great tool we have is our webinar series, of which today's webinar is a part. Today's webinar is in collaboration with the Center for Climate and Security, and we are joined by three members of the Center's advisory board. Today we're going to hear from General Ron Keyes, Commander David Slayton, and Colonel Mark Mickleby to discuss the relationship between national security and climate change. But before we get started, I'd like to turn the floor over to the Executive Director of the Southern Alliance for Clean Energy, Stephen Smith, for some introductory remarks. Well, thank you, Chris, and thank you, everyone, for joining. FACE is uh, really thrilled about this particular webinar on this particular week where we're honoring uh, the men and women who have served uh, our country, and this is a this is a great opportunity to put a spotlight on the important work that the, the military does and on a number of very important issues. You know, the Southern Alliance for Clean Energy, we do our work throughout the Southeast um, United States, and we have a number of very critical uh, national security facilities in the South, with, whether it be McDill down near Tampa, the operational center there, whether it be Fort Bragg in North Carolina, or Kings Bay, uh, or even where I am, I'm just down the road from Eglin uh, Air Force Base or the uh, Naval Air Station here in Pensacola. And these are critical facilities, and um, this, they have been key parts of the Southeast for decades and key parts of our national security. But what is also uh, evident is the United, United States military has really been taking an increasing role in both bringing attention to through studies and analysis they've done of the threats of climate change to not only our country but to our national interest and around the world because the United States, the United States military doesn't have the luxury when uh, you have a destabilization that takes place somewhere in the world or somewhere close to a U.S. vital interest they're called upon to react and react immediately. And so they are doing an increasingly uh, very proficient job of where they're understanding climate change and understanding the implications uh, to the globe and to uh, our national security. The other thing they've been doing is they've been leading by example. And that has been uh, something that we've seen a lot of in the Southeast where many of the military bases now are actually on the cutting edge of deploying advanced technologies that include renewable energy, looking at things like microgrids where they can actually uh, take the, the facility off the grid. And these are, these are important examples of bringing this technology forward. And in many cases, we've seen where technology that the military has demonstrated has then become ubiquitous in society. So it's a great honor to have uh, the three uh, uh, gentlemen that are going to share their thoughts today and for SACE to be a part of this on this very important week. So I look forward to the conversation, look forward to the comments, and we look forward to continuing to work with the military as we see more and more deployment of clean renewable energy and their leadership on bringing awareness and action on climate change. So Chris, let me turn it back over to you. Great. Thanks, Steve. Sarah, could we have the next slide, please? Thanks. So. Let's go ahead and jump into the presentations. Our first presenter, General Ron Keyes, is a member of the Center for Climate and Security's Advisory Board and the chairman of the CNA Military Advisory Board for Energy Security and Climate Change. He retired in November 2007 after completing a career of more than 40 years. He's a command pilot with more than 4,000 flying hours in fighter aircraft, including more than 300 hours of combat time. No stranger to energy security challenges, General Keyes first faced them operationally as a young Air Force captain piloting F-4s during the fuel embargo of the 1970s. Later, as a senior officer in multiple command positions, 
Fuel and logistics supply provisioning were critical decisions during humanitarian rescue and combat operations from the Balkans deep into Africa, as well as the Middle East, and in NATO operations. As director of all Air Force air, space, and cyber operations in the early 2000s, he saw the impact of energy choices on budget execution, as well as the emerging threat of climate change on operational tempo, training, and base. Finally, at Air Combat Command, where he commanded then the Air Force's largest command, comprised of 1,200 aircraft, 27 wings, 17 bases, and 105,000 personnel in 200 operation locations worldwide, he faced the total challenge of organizing, training, and equipping in the face of energy challenges and potential climate impacts. General Keyes resides in Woodbridge, Virginia, and owns RK Solution Enterprises, LLC, an independent consultancy advising various DOD agencies and non-DOD-related firms on a variety of security issues. So with that, I'll turn it over to General Keyes to get us started. Okay, thanks. Well, let me give you uh, just a quick update on the Center for Climate and Security and what, we're, what we really do. The Center for Climate and Security, it's a nonpartisan security and foreign policy institute. It's got a broad bench of foreign policy experts, military experts, and what it tries to do is facilitate policy development processes and dialogue and provide some analysis on what our challenges are, conduct their research, and act as a resource hub in the climate and security field. Our take is the unspeakable may happen whether we speak about it or not. So we're not running for office. We're not marketing technology. We're looking for the right answers to the right questions. And that becomes our, our vision and our focus. So let me start. There's a lot of talk about uh, energy security and climate change. And there are a number of people that go, well, the only reason DOD is involved is because the administration makes them be involved. I'm here to tell you that's really not the case. There is a reason why does DOD care. That's what I want to talk to you about uh, today. Next slide. For us, it's two bookends. There's energy security on one end, and there's climate change on the other. Energy security is all about combat vulnerabilities. Ten percent of the casualties that we've taken uh, downrange have been for the uh, Marines have been in convoys. Convoys are made up of, generally, the bulk is water, weapons, and fuel. Then you get to, the Army says, about every 24 convoys, someone gets seriously hurt or killed in a convoy. If every 24th trip to the gas station uh, you got shot at and hit, uh, you'd be concerned about those sort of vulnerabilities. Then you have the operational impact, just the fact of getting to the right place at the right time, in order to fuel the force. Budget instability, it doesn't matter whether fuel is $30 a barrel or $100 a barrel, if it goes up $10 a barrel, it in fact becomes about a, over a billion dollar liability, unfunded. And when, of course when it goes down, we don't get that money either, that gets scraped off. And then there's a the diplomatic impediment, the fact that we can't go where we'd like to go, when we'd like to go, just because perhaps we're doing business with those countries to provide uh, oil. Then you move over to the other bookend, climate change. It's a basing threat. As has been already said, we look at, we have about 1,700 bases, posts, outposts around the world that are, could be affected by, could be uh, affected by sea level rise. We have looked at that. We're concerned about it because when the phone rings, we have to be able to go. There's readiness challenges. There are a lot of places we can't train the way we'd like to train for the number of days we'd like to train because of heat, because of fire, because of floods. Those become a problem. Callous for conflict, you'll hear later today. The fact that lack of water, lack of food, migrations, destabilization of countries, all is a situation that makes us concerned for how much mission is out there. And then, of course, mission creep, just here in the United States, the support, military support to civilian authorities, being on the fire lines, being on the Zika line, going down and picking people off of uh, doors that are floating around in the floods. All of that takes away from 
the focus that we <clears throat> that we have for our major mission. Next slide. So you'll hear this often about, well, I'm not a climate scientist, so I understand. So we take the position you don't have to be a climate science scientist to read a thermometer or see the rain gauge, track flood stages, all of the fire season, recognize disease spread. <clears throat> we are pretty good at recognizing threats. We take the position, how bad could it be? Is that tenable? Because we go and do some things in some pretty dark, dirty places, but can we live through this? If we can't, what can we do? And what if we're wrong? And how will we know? And how will we know in time? And is there a plan B? So we look at it just as a strategic planning. We do a lot of deliberate planning, a lot of contingency planning, a lot of crisis action planning. The approach has been in DOD is to reduce demand, <clears throat> diversify supply, and change the culture so you understand, is it better to spend more money up front for a more efficient engine that over the lifetime you spend less on energy? Or is it better to get the capability now and absorb the cost of energy? And of course, build in resilience. If your main supply of energy goes down, whether it's liquid fuel or electricity or whatever it happens to be, what's your plan uh, B? Next slide. So we tie this to mission. We go and fight and win America's wars when we're called upon to do so whether that's global vigilance, whether that's humanitarian rescue or actual combat. So when we look at it, this is not about the religion and politics. This is not about big, small government or liberal conservative views or being a climate scientist. This is about resilient basing, being able to answer the call when we have to answer it, effective training so we're well-provisioned, well-equipped, and well-trained when we go. It's getting more fight for less fuel. Every <clears throat> drop of fuel that we don't use equates to more time on station, more ability to fight when we need it, more capability, less cost, and more options, less risk. So this is, for us, is all about speed, range, payload, persistence, and what we call surviving to operate. Fighting through the threat, it may be ugly, it may be a little messy, but we're gonna be there when we're called on. Next slide. So that's why we care. But it's important that everyone cares, because this is a national threat, not just DOD. You often will hear that, well, DOD uses, is the largest singular user of energy in the nation. And that's true, but that's sort of a play on word, because that's 1.7 of the national budget. So if DOD goes out of business tomorrow, we still have all these problems. So DOD can't fix a problem. We use about 350 thousand barrels of oil a day. The country uses about nine million. So the scale that we can bring to the problem is not enough to fix it. And it's sort of a Rubik's cube, if you will, <clears throat> with a few less sides. Of, it's a technical issue. What can we build? What can we design? What can we innovate? Social, what are going to be the impacts on where we live and how we live? Economic, what are going to be the impacts on how we make a living and where we make a living? And then what are the policy and politics that can drive this in the right direction? And frankly, technical is the least of the problem. And in our minds, we spend far too much time worrying about innovating in technology and far too little about innovating our policy, our processes, and our thinking to get to where we need to be. So as you look at it, I would recommend you do like the military, do the math, use all of the numbers. And when you get to the end, go back and consider. What if you're wrong? How will you know? What can you do? Next slide. Finally, I leave you with this. This is this is why we have a military. We hire hire commanders to win, not explain defeat. So we're not interested in chasing the next shiny object, because when we send America's sons and daughters into the valley of the shadow of death, we want to send them with the best equipment, the best training, the best tactics that we can, not sending them out there because we want to prove a point. So thanks for listening.
that we're going to do questions at the end of the presentation. Um, so you can go ahead and submit your question on the control panel in the bottom right-hand side of the screen. Go ahead and get those questions in, and we will um, circle back for a Q&A session after all of our presenters have, have done their presentations. Chris, so you were next, on mute. Chris, you were on mute for the first part of your comment. Um, I think we just heard the part about asking questions, so I just wanted to let you uh, know in case you said something wildly important before that that everybody might need to hear. Great. Thank you, Sarah. I just said thank you to, to General Keyes for that great presentation and um, just wanted to give a, a reminder to folks to, to uh, submit questions via the control panel on the bottom right-hand side of the screen. So now we're going to move to Commander David Slayton. Commander Slayton is a member of the Center for Climate and Security's Advisory Board, a research fellow at the Hoover Institution, a member of the Schultz-Stevenson Task Force on Energy Policy, and co-chair and executive director of the Arctic Security Initiative. He was a National Security Affairs Fellow from 2010 to 2011 and a visiting fellow from 2011 to 2012, during which time he was also engaged with legislative matters and national security policy development in Washington, D.C. During his Navy career, Commander Slayton completed 12 combat deployments to include commanding the largest U.S. Navy combat unit in Afghanistan in 2009. A career naval flight officer, he has flown more than 300 combat missions, accumulating more than 4,300 flight hours in eight different aircraft. He distinguished his unit and himself during extensive combat operations on the ground, at sea, and in the air in Afghanistan, Iraq, and surrounding theaters of operation. His combat decorations include the Bronze Star Medal, three Meritus Service Medals, and 12 Air Medals, in addition to numerous campaign medals and unit citations. Commander Slayton's research writing and contributions focus on national security, energy, the Arctic and Asia-Pacific maritime strategy. His most recent collaborative publications include Game Changers, Energy on the Move, and Distributed Power in the United States, Prospects and Policies. He's also a contributing author to the joint Hoover Brookings Institute report assessing the role of distributed power systems in the U.S. power sector. In addition, he's written, lectured, and presented on a variety of issues related to leadership, ethics, counterterrorism, cyber, and irregular warfare. His work appears in and is cited in the U.S. Congress, CNN, Fox News, Proceedings, the Hoover Digest, Brookings, and many other leading publications and institutions. He has advised and assisted numerous private and government organizations, including various startup and venture firms, the Department of Defense, the Department of the Navy, and members of both houses of the U.S. Congress. Slayton is a regular guest lecturer at Stanford's Graduate School of Business, School of Engineering, and School of Law. He earned his bachelor's degree from the University of California at Los Angeles and holds two master's degrees, one in business and leadership from the University of San Diego and the other in national security and strategic studies from the Naval War College. And now I'll turn it over to Commander Slayton. Chris, thank you for that, general, uh, that generous uh, introduction. I greatly appreciate it. Uh, I often get asked why we at Stanford and, and our group in particular stood up a, a, a working group and a task force on the Arctic. You know, why would folks in California would be considered with, uh, with, with the high north? And what I'd like to respond with is that the Arctic is a great geopolitical and geostrategic lab for what's going to be happening to the rest of, uh, the, rest of the world that's going to be happening there first and fastest, and it provides, uh, it provides a great opportunity to learn lessons now that we can apply going forward. And I think generally that's the way we approach things at the Center of Climate and Security as well, is how do we get ahead of these problems before they come uh, completely untenable. So I'm going to focus on a few items, uh, the geostrategic uh, competition between the United States and Russia in the high north, uh, the energy implications, and then how that, how that applies uh, overall. Next slide, please. Okay, great. The challenges and opportunities that, that come to us in the high north and with, with and with climate change going forward basically come down to three things as they apply uh, to the high north region and generally can be applied uh, worldwide. And that's access, uh, resources, which we've heard about from, uh, from General Keyes, and the strategic competition that occurs uh, when that's thrown out there. And we've, we've heard how uh, inundation can create security challenges are without question that's going to be key going forward and not, along with a number of other climate-based uh, items. 
You know, I got a quote there at the top from our from our Northcom commander, uh, where he basically highlights that in the past year we've seen this enormous last two years really enormous increase in activity in the high north from the Russians. You know, I would argue that this is a rational response uh, to the Russians protecting their their vital economic interests, which are now more available than they ever have be been before, not only to the Russians but to other uh, the other Arctic nations and maritime uh, powers in in the high north. But it's something to to keep our eye on as we, as the United States, likewise, uh, are an Arctic nation and have not quite uh, secured our own borders to the north uh, to the level that some of our other neighbors have as well. Uh, the other item, too, when we talk about security in the high north is the, are the cultural security uh, items. You know, what are the things that need to be in place to underpin uh, trade and commerce? How do we make sure that the area is safe, secure, and prosperous going forward so you know the, the sovereign nations that are in the Arctic can operate there in a safe and effective manner. And what we've seen recently is the, uh, the implementation or the start of the implementation and approval of the IMO Polar Code. That's going to go a long way. Uh, the changing uh, climate is also uh, making some challenges in maritime and commercial operations. Uh, the limited infrastructure is first and foremost. This is another area where Russia is far out in front. Uh, of everybody else, you know, a third of their land mass is in the Arctic, a large portion of their uh, industrial capacity is in the Arctic, as well as energy development, mining, and extractive services. Uh, again, Russia's non-diversified economy, they put a lot of emphasis on, on protecting and ensuring uh, access to their energy resources, both onshore and offshore in the Arctic. Uh, the two frameworks that are in place right now uh, that have come out of the Arctic Council are the search and rescue uh, search and rescue framework, as well as spill response. Again, these are great multinational uh, frameworks that kind of bring together the the eight uh, Arctic nations and, in particular, the five uh, maritime Arctic nations on much needed uh, interaction and uh, coordination uh, going forward. Uh, and likewise, I'll kind of finish out at the at the, at the bottom at the joint operation cross institutional coordination. Recently, the Arctic nations stood up the Coast Guard uh, forum led by the United States and the Norwegians going forward. Uh, it's a great opportunity for the non-military components uh, to to get together and underpin those areas that that uh, that support the cultural security uh, items going forward, as well as uh, increases the amount of coordination between. Uh, the Arctic, Arctic nations. So, next slide, please. As I mentioned before, uh, we have a new ocean appearing uh, on the planet, and it's the Arctic Ocean. And when we speak about uh, the Arctic, the one thing I'd like to highlight uh, are the differences between the polar regions on the planet. Uh, Antarctica is land surrounded by water, and the Arctic is water surrounded by land, two very uh, different scenarios, both geostrategically and geopolitically. And likewise, uh, the Arctic is a very resource-rich uh, area with 13% of the world's uh, oil reserves uh, contained within the Arctic Circle and 33% of the world's natural gas reserves uh, being contained within the Arctic. There's also uh, enormous deposits of nickel and zinc and a number of other uh, resources with uh, natural resources like fish and uh, and different fisheries. And these, again, are all potential areas that uh, can lead to to uh, strategic competition between uh, between sovereign nations. And we're kind of starting to see that right now. Do I necessarily think this is going to be a significant um, high intensity conflict going forward? No, but as we've seen Russia exercise in recent years, uh, most notably, in Crimea, it's kind of very low-level, irregular warfare, um, sub-ROSA approach to achieving their geopolitical means uh, through military and through other areas. And again, we, we now have this new opening geopolitical space, geostrategic space between the United States, our allies, and Russia. And it's something that we need to be concerned with. And it's being fed by Russia's continued uh, requirement for resources out of their high north, they're a non-diversified economy, they have very limited availability to generate income, and natural gas and oil uh, are it. So we'll continue to see that pressure uh, that they're under to produce uh, that comes in conflict with the 
uh, with other nations, particularly NATO and the United States, uh, with other nations' uh, interest in the, in the region going forward. Next slide, please. Here's a rundown on some of the major uh, energy and extractive processes that are taking place in the Arctic. Again, they're significant. Russia uh, is leading the way again, non-diversified economy because they are dependent on, on oil and gas and very vulnerable to the price of, uh, of oil, which is a global commodity and gas, which they're tied to the European uh, market. Norway's right behind them, likewise, a non-diversified economy, how, however much stronger. Uh, economy and uh, much better managed, much smaller population and uh, has some additional things going for it. Uh, Canada is, uh, now we'll see with the new Trudeau government, how, how much further they, they pursue some of the items they have underway. Uh, Greenland, uh, likewise, extractive uh, activities, not only with, with oil and gas, but likewise, China has made large foreign direct investments uh, in, in Greenland for their resources, which also has geopolitical and geostrategic implications uh, with our friends and allies and uh, also with China uh, as a whole. And I, I list there at the bottom of the mining. Uh, that is an enormous uh, and growing uh, activity, and particularly as we see the demand for commodities worldwide kind of ebbing and flowing with the, uh, with the world economy. We'll continue to see activity likewise mirror uh, mirror the world economy, but more, more specifically, it's going to be tied to uh, the economic development and health of China, Russia, and the United States going forward. Next slide. Here's just a highlight. I mentioned that uh, as the ice cap uh, gets smaller and smaller and access gets greater and greater, we're going to continue to see uh, increased maritime activity and access. Uh, within the Arctic, you see based on the four, uh, on this dashboard I have here broken out by domain, uh, passenger ships basically see that as, as, uh, as tourist and eco-tourism, oil and gas and the uh, support services that go along with that all throughout the Arctic. Uh, fishing uh, is also important and I think it's an important item to note that more wars have been fought uh, throughout human history over fish than anything else. Uh, and then we see cargo transport. And this is not just um, container ships, actually. It's more for uh, oil tankers, dry bulk storage and whatnot. And you'll see just by the mere facts uh, and highlights that the majority of the maritime traffic is indeed uh, around the GI-UK gap and around the Kola Peninsula, the area around Norway and, uh, and the Murmansk area. And that's just because it's more navigable, historically has been a more navigable part of the high north because of the Gulf Stream coming in to that area. That said, as we have the continuing opening of the Arctic, we're going to see this, this traffic increase in a somewhat nonlinear way. So it's going to increase in the areas where it already is high, and it's going to start to increase in areas such as the Bering Strait. Uh, and what's going to drive this, this, this latest a uh, deal between Russia and China for natural gas, 30 year, uh, a 30 year agreement between those two countries. A majority of that natural gas is gonna be shipped from the Amal Peninsula and Russia through the Bering Strait down to China until they get the land-based infrastructure in place. This is a new uh, higher, higher traffic rate. All the support vessels that go into that are gonna be very important to see going forward. And again, one of the things we need, we highlight to uh, to our government is the fact that we do indeed share an international border with Russia. It's a maritime border. We also share in the, uh, in the administration and the maintenance of an international strait, and that's the Bering Strait. And it's, a, it's an area that's now presently being used more by Russia uh, and her, her friends than, uh, than the United States and something that's going to demand more attention whether we want to or not uh, from the United States going forward. Next slide, please. There's another item, too, I mentioned before on the previous slide, an increase in, uh, in tourism in the high north. And the example that I have presented here, uh, you see in the upper part of the slide, is the coast of Concordia. Okay, this, this accident, this maritime accident, happened uh, in very warm waters. Uh, 5,000 people were basically able to just jump off that ship and swim the shore in 75-degree water. 
if we have a similar incident that happens up in the Arctic, either off the east or west coast of Greenland or up through the Bering Strait and around uh, the high north around Alaska or Canada, the scenario is going to be quite different. Uh, we, have the, we have the potential of having a significant accident where a number of the people will, will survive the initial incident, but they will not survive uh, the rescue. And this is where, you know, again, the two frameworks that I highlighted earlier are so important, the search and rescue uh, capacity and capability build out of, all, of, the, of the Arctic nations, as well as the spill response. But this would, you know, if, if and when, and I would say it's not going to be an if, it's going to be when, we have a major uh, civilian civil disaster in the high north that either involves the downing of a, of a wide-body jet in the high north, or we have a cruise ship uh, that runs aground, which is a high potential. Uh, it's going to quickly, it's going to quickly highlight the fact that we're not prepared uh, to be operating at that level in the high north, and that the governments involved uh, need to come together to build out the capacity and the capability, not only to support the, the, the ongoing tourist activity, but as I mentioned before, to underpin and and support uh, economic development that we know is going to continue to take place in the access that's going to continue to take place as, as the sea ice melts, as access increases, as the number of people flowing into the area goes up and as economic activity uh, increases going forward. Next slide. Okay, the things I'd like to leave you with, the takeaways, the challenges. Uh, that are going to be presented to us by, by changing and climate warming climate going forward are threefold. Economic impact, first and foremost. I often talk to my environmentalist friends that their, that their argument is going to be taken over by the insurance industry. General Keyes mentioned this earlier. The inundation of coastal areas, not only in the United States but throughout the world, is going to dramatically impact coastal infrastructure, which are economic drivers uh, of, of the leading economies around the world. And when we can no longer underwrite and shore these major infrastructure projects going forward, that's going to have a major impact. And when you have economic decline, that directly impacts governance, which directly impacts uh, security of sovereign nations worldwide. Uh, number two, I'm kind of leading into that, is are the government impacts. When you have uh, water security challenges, food security challenges, and health challenges that are caused by climate change, all these things directly uh, undermine govern, uh, governance and the strength of governance of nations worldwide. We've seen that uh, in Syria. We've seen that in a number of places already, and I think we're going to continue to see these strong link with linkages between water security, food security, and health security undermining uh, sovereign governments and leading to a decay in governance. Uh, in, these, in these areas that are affected. And again, those, the first two I mentioned directly roll into the security impacts of climate change. This is what we're, what we're talking about here, what we at the Center for Climate and Security focus on uh, as, a, as a point, and what we'll continue to work on going forward. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll turn it back over to the host, and thank you for listening. Thank you, Commander Slayton. That was, that was a great presentation. Uh, really appreciated learning that from you. As a reminder to our participants, we're going to do questions at the end of the session. So um, if you have any questions now, please go ahead and submit them while they're, while they're fresh on your mind. You can do that in the control panel in the bottom right-hand side of your screen. And uh, we will go through them at the end of the session. So now I'd like to turn the floor over to our final presenter, um, which will, uh, who, who's Colonel Mark Puck Mickleby. Mark Mickleby is a member of the Center for Climate and Security's Advisory Board. He was commissioned as a second lieutenant in the Marine Corps following his graduation from the United States Naval Academy in 1987. He was designated a naval aviator in April 1990 and has a qualified FA-18 pilot in December 1990. From January 1991 to May 2006, he served in five fleet fighter squadrons and perform numerous operational squadron billets to include director of safety and standardization, pilot training officer, aircraft maintenance officer, operations officer, executive officer, and commanding officer. He is a graduate of Marine Weapons and Tactics Instructor School, the Navy Fighter Weapons School, and the Allied Air Force, Air, Allied Air Force's Central Europe's Tactical Leadership Program. 
Mark's operational experience includes numerous deployments, land-based and ship-borne, to the European, Pacific, and Southwest Asian theaters in support of operations Provide Promise, Deny Flight, Southern Watch, and Iraqi Freedom. His staff experience includes serving as the George Washington Battle Group Liaison Officer to Joint Task Force Southwest Asia in 1997, serving as a Marine Air Ground Task Force Staff Training Program Instructor from 1999 to 2001, and serving as the Harry S. Truman Battle Group Liaison Officer to the NATO Combined Air Operations Center 5 headquarters in January 2003. In June 2007, Mark was assigned to the U.S. Special Operations Command, where he developed strategy for Special Operations Forces. From July 2009 until April 2011, he served as a Special Strategic Assistant to the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. In that capacity, he co-authored with Navy Captain Wayne Porter a National Strategic Narrative, a concept and vision for a 21st century grand strategy for the nation. Mark retired from the Marine Corps in July 2011 and joined the New America Foundation to work on grand strategy and sustainability. He is now the co-director of the Strategic Innovation Lab at Case Western Reserve University. Mark graduated from the United States Naval Academy with distinction in 1987. He earned a Master's of Military Studies from the Marine Corps Command and Staff College in 1999. In May 2007, he graduated from the Air War College with distinction and earned a Master's of Strategic Studies. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Colonel Nickleby. Hey, thanks, Chris. Uh, really appreciate that. Um, I want to uh, maybe shift gears just a wee bit. We're, yeah, we're talking here to uh, climate change. I just want to maybe expand our aperture a little bit, maybe even talk about it maybe some opportunities that are available to actually do something uh, about it. Uh, and so if you go to the next slide, please. But in order to get there, I mean, we do have to kind of plow through the challenge. What is the challenge? And I just wanted to show, you know, what does security look like on, you know, on Main Street? Well, you know, the pictures there, generally, people, that's what people are thinking about. They're thinking about defense when it comes to national security, at least as you listen to our, uh, the politicals and the election cycle or what we tend to focus on, whether it's ISIS, whether it's Al Qaeda, whether it's whoever. Uh, well, just take a look, you know, whether you're talking about Gaza, whether you're talking about in Syria and Homs and in, in Fallujah, I mean, that's what we look like in urban combat. That's the kind of fight we've been in uh, since 2001. But look at that last picture. That's Greensburg, Kansas. Kansas. In 2007, a cataclysmic uh, tornado ripped through that town and flattened it. Uh, and I just want to point out what the you know, civilian ca casualty rates. Now, that's not full casualty rates, but if you, you strap on a uniform and carry a gun, you expect to get uh, a little mussed up and bruised uh, when you go to the fight. But from a civilian casualty rate, uh, talking about a significant, uh, for, uh, some, right around the 300% uh, increase in civilian casualty rates. Next slide. The main point of why I'm even bringing that up is that Mother Nature really doesn't care about ROE. You know, she's an equal opportunity threat, and that's what we're messing with. Uh, and we really got to come to grips with that. The national security 21st century style has very little to do with our ability to uh, deploy abroad and engage in and close with and destroy the enemy. Uh, that's national defense. You need to have that. I'm a firm believer, you know, Marine Corps 101 kind of guy that, you know, we need to have a strong defense. But national security is far more broad. It has more to do with uh, the integration of the systems that constitute our society today. I'm talking about food, water, energy, built environment, transportation, education, industry. Those are the things that constitute national security today. The next slide, please. And in that light, if we really want to look at what the challenge is, climate change is just a part of it, but it's just not about climate change. It's about how is our current global system operating? Not only today, but what do we see as the big trend lines going forward? And this is what takes us into the realm of Grand Strategy 101 uh, for the United States in particular. Because in the United States, when we do Grand Strategy, we as a nation take on the great global challenge of the age, and we do it by leveraging our economy, uh, we stand on our economy, let it do the strategic heavy lifting, and then we align our governing institutions and our foreign policy to take on that big challenge. I mean, that's what we did in World War II. We were the arsenal of democracy. We took on global fascism. In the Cold War, once again, we stood on our economy uh, and set up a contest of political and economic systems against the, uh, the communist world to take on global communism. Uh, but today, our global challenge is well beyond just climate change. Uh, it includes what we would, I would consider four big pillars that are all intertwined, uh, they are all interrelated, 
and you can't deal with just one discreetly. You've got to take them all on at the same time. And those four big pillars are, number one, are economic inclusion. Uh, everyone gets a sweaty lip over the fact we're going to have about 9 billion people on the world in the middle of the century. But the number that scares me the most is that we have to fold in 3 billion people into the global middle class. Uh, and when they arrive, that leads us to uh, big problem number two, is that their resource consumption goes up 300 uh, percent given uh, normal conditions or uh, 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 all things uh, normal as today, given the status quo. And that we just simply cannot afford. Climate change is part of it. We're already on the path to three to uh, you know three and a half to over five degrees centigrade of global uh, warming. But we've also overshot uh, Mother Nature's ability to support the human condition right now. Right now, we're consuming one and a half planets worth of resources to support ourselves. By the middle of the century, we're going to need four and a half planets, and we've already overshot four of nine planetary boundaries. Uh, and the interesting thing is that. For some reason, we're really just focused in on problem number three, which is uh, we seem to think we're just in this recession, that we're going to be able to get back to where we were before 2008. Well, uh, my opinion is that we're actually uh, in a contained depression, that we are still, that what we experienced in 2008 was just as great of a deleveraging moment as what we experienced in 1929 uh, that caused the Great Depression. Yet uh, right now, we just can't seem to understand that. And we're still in the process of deleveraging from 2008. And the crisis has been contained by extraordinary federal intervention in terms of monetary and fiscal policy. Uh, but that's just keeping light, uh, the system on life support. And even if we could plow through that, uh, just using monetary and fiscal policy uh, to get us to a different place economically, uh, we still have to face the problem that we're in a resilience deficit. That we're fundamentally, just as uh, Deke just mentioned, our infrastructure, we lack resilience. Uh, we are right now $3.6 trillion in arrears. Uh, and by the way, all our, our infrastructure is mostly pointed at uh, the economy of the 20th century, not at the requirements of the 21st century. And therefore, we are highly uh, 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 vulnerable to things ranging from anywhere from cyber to acts of uh, uh, terrorism to acts of mother nature. And we have to come to grips with that and take that on. Next slide, please. But the good news is, what I'm proud to tell you, is that we have an opportunities way forward. If we could just strap on uh, sustainability goggles, and I gotta tell you, I'm not talking about it from a green perspective, I'm not talking about it from any kind of uh, political or ideological perspective. I'm taking it from a perspective of a military guy that was asked to look at this stuff by, by the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And so a very pragmatic view and a very systems view, a science view. Sustainability brings us to uh, uh, the lens of sustainability, brings us to a solution set that's at the scale of the problem. And like I said before, when America does grand strategy well, we stand on our economy. And in order to reinvigorate our economy, we have to focus in on demand. And through that sustainability lens, we can see three huge big bins of pent up demand that are exist right today that we can activate with the existing capital. And just real quickly, those three things are how we build our communities. Can we move from suburban sprawl to smart growth, that walkable community model, that mixed use, mixed income, service rich, transit oriented community? The answer is yes, we can. The design is in place, but most importantly, we have the demand signal. Right now, uh, across the United States, according to the National Association of Realtors, is that we, Americans today, 60% uh, of them want walkable communities. Uh, why is that? Because we are sitting on the, one of the largest demographic convergences in the marketplace for housing that we've seen uh, since uh, the end of World War II. Specifically, baby boomers and millennials are converging in the marketplace. Baby boomers are downsizing, they, you know, kids are gone, uh, they don't want to be stuck out in the suburbs where people, you know, where the kids take away their keys and somebody shovels applesauce in their face in an old folks home. They don't want to live that way anymore in the gated community. They want to go to a place where they're connected, uh, where they can get to services, and they are mobile. And millennials don't want to be there either. Uh, they're just now starting families. Uh, they're looking to buy their uh, first housing purchase, and they don't want to be stuck out in the suburbs. Uh, in fact, about 78% of them don't even want to own a car going into the future. Completely different demand signal, completely different uh, desire on the part of consumers. And we can tap into that right now. And just to put it in a historical context, that demand for uh, walkable communities is three times the level of demand uh, than what uh, we had for suburban sprawl uh, post-World War II when a return, GI, GIs returned from World War II. 
Uh, and we know that that demand signal for suburbia fueled our economy through the late 70s to the early 80s. This is huge. It's significant. It's historic. On top of that, uh, the third, second bin is agriculture. Right now, uh, according to the OECD, uh, we need to increase our food production by 60% and 100% of that has to be regenerative, where we uh, reduce our uh, water intensity, where we fix our nitrogen uh, cycles and carbon, uh, 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 the uh, amount of carbon required to develop uh, or produce uh, agriculture. And the cool thing about this is right now we have the technologies to do it in terms of regenerative agriculture te uh, technologies, whether you're talking about uh, organic uh, farming techniques, uh, low water intensity techniques, perennial techniques to uh, urban agriculture and controlled environment agriculture. We have the ability to do this. And what's interesting about this is that according to Rodale Institute, per acre, just so we can get to the, the bottom line numbers, is per acre we have equivalent yields uh, using regenerative agriculture techniques as compared to our current, uh, uh, what we can call industrial model. Uh, it, as a matter of fact, it's 30% greater turn, during times of drought. But more importantly, when you consider externalities, it's three times more profitable per acre using regenerative techniques. And finally, a resource productivity. With the three billion new middle class uh, uh, aspirants that I just uh, mentioned earlier, they want stuff. And we have the ability now that we can deliver that kind of stuff at a radically reduced resource intensity, leveraging things anywhere from 3D printing, uh, stereo lithography, advanced uh, manufacturing techniques, advanced materials, and renewable energy. Next slide, please. And the cool thing about it is that business can lead this whole charge, specifically because we have a huge pool of underutilized capital, specifically three, over $3 trillion in corporate cash sitting on a fence. We've got $7 trillion uh, uh, that are sitting in zero coupon bonds. And some of them are even negative at this point. And even just as importantly, we have over $24 trillion in U.S. retirement assets transitioning from the greatest generation to baby boomers and baby boomers to millennials. An enormous volume of cash that right now are just not being activated uh, to propel our economy in a new direction. Huge amount of money to activate around those three big bins of demand. And in the process of doing that, uh, American business can actually deal with this big stranded asset problem, specifically around the unburnable hydrocarbons, the some, upwards to $20 trillion of hydrocarbons that are sitting underground that we can't afford to burn. But our current, uh, that $20 trillion, unfortunately, happens to be in, baked into the books on most of the businesses across uh, the United States and inside of all of our own 401ks. Uh, it's a very vexing problem. We simply cannot rip $20 trillion off, off, the, balance, off the balance sheet and uh, uh, and make uh, and be able to take care of uh, the hydrocarbon problem. Uh, I'm not also talking about the public infrastructure, et cetera. But the, here's the interesting thing, particularly around the uh, unburnable hydrocarbons, is that as I mentioned before, the productivity revolution with advanced materials, particularly polymers and uh, uh, carbon uh, advanced composite carbon materials. We can actually use those hard hydrocarbons, transition them away from the energy uh, uh, side of our economy. Instead of sending the value up to the smokestack, we can move them into advanced materials uh, specifically to feed the, uh, built, uh, the building material requirements for the built environment with a growing urbanization across, across the world. Uh, Shell is already looking at, at this. We fundamentally could shift 80% of our hydrocarbons into uh, the material side of the house and replace high carbon uh, lumber, steel, uh, aluminum, and concrete. Huge opportunity to actually take on at scale using the econo uh, economics of sustainability to take on this big vexing problem. Next slide, please. And so I just wanted to point out that this isn't just a pipe dream. Next slide, please. That there are actual business models that are being developed right now. Uh, that there is a new industrial ec ecosystem that is right now burgeoning up that if we, uh, from a, a national perspective, could be uh, integrate these, we could have a huge, new, powerful economic engine that could not only lead the United States in a different grand strategic direction, but also lead the world in a different direction towards a different type of uh, uh, ecosystem when it comes to uh, business and economics. And just to give you some examples, I mean, we have these 10 basic uh, sectors of our economy, and there are new business models being developed in each one of them. 
uh, and that if they fundamentally, because of the nature of how our economy, how everything is intertwined, they have to relate to each other. And I just want to get, I can't get into depth on this thing, but I want to just give you two examples, specifically transportation. Ford Motor Company is now recognizing that they can't just be a car and truck building company anymore, that they're moving into, uh, they're basically doing a Xerox. They're moving into a uh, multimodal transportation service company. So it's going to be Ford Mobility uh, Company, where they recognize that the value of what they provide isn't in the gear. The value is what they pro is in the is in the service that they provide in terms of mobility. They are now actively moving in that direction. In terms of oil and gas, Shell right now is looking at walking across the natural gas bridge and move in uh, their hydrocarbon assets and preserve the value of their material capital assets in terms of drills, et cetera, uh, and move into developing advanced materials for what the uh, the growing, particularly uh, again in the built environment, but also for the uh, consumer. Uh, products. Now, they still want to stay in the energy business in terms of renewable energy, but they recognize that they need to be able to preserve the value of their asset and move it in a direction that's going to meet uh, not only the requirements of consumers, but the uh, requirements of Mother Earth at the same time. Next slide, please. So I mean, but I, for me, uh, you got to go where the meat meets the metal. You got to go down to Main Street. So all the big arm wave stuff about the, uh, uh, you know, the macro economy is interesting. But it, if it doesn't translate down to Main Street, USA, uh, you know, it's kind of just a pipe dream. And this is the interesting thing about those three big bins of demand of walkable communities, regenerative agriculture, and productivity revolution. If we could capture those things, we could actually reinvigorate economy, our economy on Main Street and have impact on people's lives. That eye chart at the bottom of the screen there, that's basically just a report that came out about 2012. And just well, all that says is that for each sector of the economy, as it's listed down there, uh, for every dollar that that uh, sector puts out, what their ancillary economic benefit is. Well, to the far right of uh, that uh, graph, uh, that's where our economy currently is pointed. From basically from retail trade to finance services, you only get 55 cents to 63 cents of ancillary economic activity out of those uh, those sectors for every buck they put out. However, next slide, please. If we capture those big bins of demand, we can actually start providing prosperity and security uh, together for future generations by, by focusing on those big bins of demand. Because look where the impact is in terms of economy uh, or economics on Main Street. You start all of a sudden creating manufacturing jobs. For every buck that sector puts out, you get another buck 35. Agriculture, number two, bucks 20. Construction, 97 cents. And transportation, 95 cents. That's where the new economy is being, uh, can move to. That's where sustainability becomes powerful. And oh, by the way, that's how we take on climate change. Instead of wringing our hands, moaning what's gonna, what could possibly happen and worried about how we're gonna hunker down and build bigger walls and make sure that we can withstand it, we can actually get out in front of it, use the power of the American economic engine to actually start addressing the problem at the scale uh, and that's going to require America to come to grips again with this notion of grand strategy because we have to have solutions at the scale of the problem and not just hunker down for what is right now inevitable. Uh, we do still have the power and the capacity to shape ourselves for the future in an opportunities-based way. Because after all, we are supposed to be the land of opportunity. We're not the land of uh, threat and risk. Uh, and we need to start walking the talk. And the good news is, is we can make, we can do well and we can, uh, uh, by doing good. And that's kind of the American way, at least as I understand it. Next slide. And I know that was a fire hose, but, and uh, sorry for the, you know, the overt plug here, but we do have a book, me and my co-authors, uh, Patrick Doherty and Joel McCower, uh, coming out on June 14th that go into depth, more depth about what I'm talking about here. And basically it's a nonpartisan, non-ideological approach to how grant strategy uh, can translate into a new business plan for America. I mean, this is the work that started at Special Operations Command and did for Admiral Mullen, uh, but we see business as being the lead agent to get America heading in a new direction, that sustainability as a system, as an economic organizing logic, is uh, uh, how we can frame this out and tap into big bins of demand and get our capital working for us again. And the interesting thing is we can do it under existing policy. So it doesn't matter whether, uh, whether or not Washington gets on board, uh, we can get this thing done now. Uh, and it's, uh, in my opinion, uh, this is uh, the convenient opportunity that's, uh, that's facing us. So thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Colonel Nickleby. That was a great presentation distilling the security and defense lens down into 
um, a national strategy and solutions going forward, how we can how we can transition the economy to a sustainable economy. So uh, thank you uh, to all three of our panelists. These were great presentations. And I want to transition now into uh, Q&A portion. We're coming up on the hour, and I hope it's okay with our panelists if we go for a few minutes after the hour so that we have um, a little bit of time for questions. We do have a number of questions um, that will probably already take up uh, all the time we have allotted, but um, I would like to see your questions so we can see what, what you're thinking is about this. So um, uh, for the participants, I mean, so please go ahead and, and if you have any questions, check them in in the Q&A box on the control panel on, on the bottom right-hand side of the screen. We're going to try to get, um, get through as many as possible. So let's go ahead and get into the questions. And I'm going to, um, in the interest of time, try to roll, I might try to roll um, multiple questions into one. So here's the first one for all of the panelists. I'm going to roll a couple questions together here. Could you please explain the concept of climate change as a threat multiplier that aggravates existing stressors and can lead to conflict? And then also, um, how can we use uh, the idea, that idea as a multiplier and the uh, climate change focus on defense, um, how can we use defense as a more compelling argument in support of climate action for those who don't sympathize with environmentalism? Let me, let me jump on, on the second part of that. I think uh, my team, my teammates have really have got some good answers for the first part of that. But the second part of it, I think it's important that people understand that defense is only a small part of national security. And so really, I don't believe when I go around the country and I do that a lot and talk to people, I have to say that the reason we're focused on it is from a purely selfish focus. It, it affects our mission effectiveness. Efficient mission effectiveness is what we're all all about what we can bring to the table though is we believe this is real we believe it's happening and we believe we need to do things but when you look at a port a fort uh, a base those are just little villages out there and so the things we do in our little villages are readily adaptable to the villages on the outside of the fence in fact in many cases we have partnered with the villages on the outside of the fence because even if we make, for example, Langley Air Force Base absolutely sustainable in the face of sea level rise and climate change, we still have most of our people that live in Hampton and Newport News and Norfolk, and we still get our electricity from the outside. We still get our fuel from the outside. And so we have to have a sort of a cooperative arrangement. And there are a lot of working groups that are working that around the country with the communities that we live in and support uh, the bases and the forts uh, and the ports. So I think that's the, that's the approach that we need to take, the fact that, remember, national security is economic security, it's uh, food security, it's all of these securities. It's not just a young lady or a young man with a gun. People tend to think of national security, ah, that's the military. No, it isn't. National security is the sum total of all these uh, all these things. So I don't believe that that's going to drive people when DOD says, well, it's a national security issue. We, we look at the small national security, the capital and capital S national security is a, is a issue that I think the other panelists have, have really are better, uh, tenant can address better. And this is uh, uh, this is Mick will be here. And I just want to pile on to what General Keyes just said, but because uh, I couldn't agree more that national security is far beyond national defense. But I also want to just consider because uh, in 2010, when the QDR, for, you know, the Quadrennial Defense Committee first highlighted climate change as a national security issue, uh, something that defense had to deal with in terms of basing, et cetera, and just the operational environment, uh, folks have jumped on that. And so point to the uh, DOD and saying, look, they're, they're taking it seriously. Why can't uh, we? Well, the issue, one of the biggest issues that I'm concerned about is that if we have to look to uh, the military uh, to validate anything that we need to take care of in this country, 
uh, if we need to have the military uh, uh, anointed as something that's important before we act on it, I'm really concerned about the fabric of this country, quite frankly. Uh, and that national security, again, 21st century style, is far beyond defense. It's all these functioning systems. That is the role of citizens of this republic. Uh, it's not just the 1% that strap on a uniform. That's the message that needs to get out. It's not uh, follow the military lead. It, we, si we swear an oath to the Constitution, and we swear an oath that puts civilian leadership in front of us. We're subservient to that leadership. We're subservient to the citizens of the United States. Uh, and the challenge needs to go out, in my opinion, to Americans to start taking their own security in the, into their own very capable hands. So. Uh, I just need to get that little outburst out there. But uh, I'm always concerned when it says, let's use DOD as the, the poster child for climate change, addressing climate change. I think it's a fundamental mistake uh, for our country. Yeah. And I just add to that, as I go around and talk to people, I, I'm on that same sheet of music. But when I talk to people locally, they, they are, in fact, taking their fate in their hands because they see the impact. They see the flood that's higher than any flood they've ever had since granddad was alive. Uh, they see the wildfire. They see the, the impact on their community. They, they're they concerned about carbon emissions and whether they have walking spaces and mass transit and things like that. And so what I see is at the local level, this stuff is, is catching at the grassroots. It's a matter of, as you said, a lot of these things have to be connected together. Now, what I think the DOD does bring to the to the uh, table is the fact that we're generally seen as an apolitical outfit, fairly conservative, and we're not faddish. And so, if we think it's real, well, it's okay. Uh, maybe maybe it is real. The military has looked at it, and when they go into harm's way, they're willing to take some of their energy, some of their thought, and some of their money, and and apply it to this particular uh, this particular area. Okay, we're 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 doing the right thing. And I'll take the uh, I'll, this is uh, David Slayton. I'll take the portion about the threat multiplier and just kind of not only look back on history but project forward. Uh, as we know, those of us who are have studied military history, military operations, and conducted combat operations, weather plays heavily in everything that we do and planning and execution uh, prior, during, and afterwards. And as we've seen uh, recently just in the, the, the severe weather impacts uh, around the world, this not only impacts operations that are ongoing, but it impacts, as uh, General Keyes and both Puck brought up earlier, it impacts our installations. And this is not only uh, weather impacts on land, but also at sea. And not only our land-based installations, but our coastal uh, based installations as well. So that's what I see as the number one uh, threat multiplier from, from a changing and dynamic uh, climate going forward. The other item that's not often highlighted, but in my opinion, is fairly significant. It's one of the initial indicators and biggest sensitivities to, uh, to warming and changing temperatures around the world are disease, are disease vectors. Again, another factor that affects large numbers of highly concentrated folks and uh, impacts combat uh, operations, impacts operational ability. You know, there are a number of pathogens around the world that are sensitive to temperature change of less than one degree, which is why we're seeing more and more of these pandemics and epidemics and uh, diseases popping up in places that they've never been or they haven't been in a long time is because these subtle changes, these are, these are indicators, these are the initial flags uh, that things are changing on a very large scale. So again, I'll, I'll encourage people to not only look at the, at the rain gauges and the, and the temperature gauges, but also look at disease vectors, look at where, where health issues are popping up around the world, and then pulling the thread back through on how uh, the changes in those areas, uh, as far as temperature goes, has has been a, a leading or contributing factor to the to those disease sectors going forward. And I'll I'll end there and turn it back over to the host. I just I just would like to add one other thing: is this, when you talk about a threat multiplier, it's really there's such a thing as failed states in this world, 
and there are there are such a thing as failing states. And so when you look at the threats from those areas, we, we look at it as both a threat multiplier, a catalyst for conflict, whatever you want to call it. But the fact that if you don't have enough food, you don't have enough water, you have forced migrations, you get lots of people in either refugee camps or in large cities, there's nothing for them to do. They're, they're trying to find a way to sustain uh, their lives. It's a hot, it really is a, an incubator for uh, activism, uh, terrorism. There are governments out there that they would if they could, but they can't provide the basic services for their people as it is. If they start to get uh, major famine, major drought, uh, they're gonna go under. When they go under, who comes into that vacuum? There are other countries out there that were feckless to begin with. Uh, they were ripping off uh, the people that they were supposed to be taken care of, and now they're in a worse situation. And so we see that as the, when we talk about threat multipliers, that around the world there's lots of places where we have failing states or almost failing states, and we're to the point where we can't save everybody. Uh, we have to start doing the triage nationally as, okay, what's in our national interest? Where can we help? Where can we partner with our allies so they can help? Where can we partner with potential allies to help them get ahead of the issue that they may face so we don't have to cut a deployment order uh, and show up in force. Great. Thank you all for, for your perspectives on that. We're going to take one more question and then we're going to have to um, end the webinar just to respect everybody's time. Uh, so thank you all uh, for participating and sending in your questions. Again, I'm going to roll a few together into this one question so you can um, address these related perspectives. Commander Slayton shared some pro very profound potential impacts from development and activity resulting from melting Arctic sea ice. What is DOD's perspective on renewable energy directly or indirectly mitigating these potential impacts? And also, uh, what is DOD's perspective on the role of specifically distributed renewable energy? I'll, uh, this is David Slayton. I'll, I'll start off with that one. I'll, I'll first say that uh, I'll start with the region. I know there are a number of initiatives right now, you know, starting, as I mentioned before earlier, with the IMO polar code to reduce uh, fossil fuel emissions in the high north. It's just a more sensitive area. It's more reactive to to greenhouse gases and black soot and a number of other items that do uh, compound much more quickly in the high north. Plus, there's just enormous uh, possibilities, particularly in wind energy, that can be applied in, in the high north. Generally, DOD uh, is driving towards having a 25% use of renewables for their facilities worldwide, not just here in the United States, but, but worldwide. And they're tracking towards that, and they're applying some very interesting uh, integration concepts and, and technology and applications uh, to do just that. And then the third part of that is distributed generation. As we all know, when you produce power where you need it, you automatically are building in uh, significant levels of energy assurance and energy security. And, and those of us like Puck and I who are used to working in an expeditionary environment, that's, that's your only challenge. You're not just going to show up someplace uh, in a valley or a mountaintop or out in the middle of nowhere and, and plug into a grid. So all likewise, you know, the DOD is spending a significant amount of, of, uh, of resources in doing further investigation, refining the technology and application and distributed generation, smart grids, uh, being able to manage and monitor and dynamically reallocate uh, energy just so it's more efficient and kind of get away from the standard kind of supply and balance, uh, even with a small grid, with uh, software controlled uh, distribution system, things that can more accurately and more quickly monitor loads and needs, uh, can aggregate different forms of inputs from re renewables as well as traditional resources and then get them out in a standardized and secure way. And uh, yeah, this is Puck. I just want to uh, dive in on uh, that as well. And I think this is another. This is a place where DoD can uh, the things that DoD figures out in terms of technologies, as Deke was saying, whether it's you know, you know microgrids or the uh, various forms of generation, also storage. 
just you know, figuring out those technologies based on what we do has great application to, to translate into the commercial environment, just like the, you know, the internet, as an example, did. You know, specifically in the context of Hurricane Sandy, uh, the ability to have uh, distributed uh, renewables, re distributed uh, dis uh, distri uh, uh, distribution systems uh, just builds resilience. Uh, and, oh, by the way, it's a great way to generate jobs, new technologies, and new workforce that's competitive, uh, globally competitive uh, and brings manufacturing types of uh, uh, So we're not just strictly, again, that service retail consumerism type of uh, economy. Uh, huge potential uh, here because there is a global demand signal for this type, that type of energy uh, production and distribution. So thank you. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for your perspectives on that. Thank you for um, taking a few minutes with us after after the hour. And thank you um, to all of our participants who um, were with us today. I want to uh, go ahead and, and extend a, a very big thank you to General Ron Keyes, Commander David Slayton, and Colonel Mark Mickleby. Thank you all very much. And I will turn it now over to Sarah Gillum to wrap us up. All right, well, that's a, a pretty tough uh, deck of speakers to follow. Um, thank you so much. I echo what Chris said, really excellent pre presentation. I certainly learned quite a bit. Um, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today and for your thoughtful questions. We will do our best. I know we didn't get to a majority of the questions that were submitted, but we'll try and get to those and follow up with you via email. Um, today's presentation has been recorded and will be available on the webinar archive page of cleanenergy.org. We will also send you a link to that recording once it has been processed. Uh, if you join, enjoyed today's presentation, which I think many of us did, uh, consider joining SAFE so that we can continue to work towards clean energy solutions for the Southeast. Visit cleanenergy.org for info on how to join and how to become involved. All right, thanks guys. Take care. Have a good day. Sweat for us, release. <laughs> <laughs> See, once, but once they get going, it's like it's really, yeah, it's not that bad. Yeah. It's all the prep. Yeah, it's a lot of prep. A lot, a lot of prep. Come in.